So in Acts chapter 1, uh, and today is Pentecost Sunday, we, we celebrate this day because as we're going to read here, God brings forth His promise of power to His people. And there's, there's great controversy uh, within uh, the world today about this, not this particular thing that's happening, but the controversy is whether or not this is available today. I just read a, a thread this week, for some, and people get nasty. People get mad about whether or not the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the empowerment that is in due on high, they almost get downright nasty, which completely negates the fruit of the Spirit, right? And so uh, they, they argue against it. And I am here to tell you, I've seen stuff here today. Well, we're baptized in the Holy Spirit the very moment we get saved. Well, there's a partial truth to that. You're not baptized. The Holy Spirit comes in and indwells in you. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a separate thing that is available to you if you so want it, and we're going to find out here in the next few moments how you can receive that and how that can be maintained in your life. But before we get to that, I want to just look at Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 4, and then we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. It says this, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he, Jesus, gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but I want you to wait for the gift my father promised. I want you to wait for it. You've heard me speak about this, he said. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Everybody with me? Let's flip over to Acts chapter 2. Let's look at that. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, everybody say suddenly, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and the Bible says all of them were filled, everybody say filled. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This word filled, it's a Greek word, 4130. It means, uh, it's pronounced pletho, not pleido. It means pletho, and it means to, to fill, to fill. It also means this, influence. Influence. All of them were influenced by the Holy Spirit. It means this. That word, pletho, it means to supply. And I love that one because all of them were supplied with the Holy Spirit. They, they were e- equipped. It, this word means to accomplish, but this word also means to furnish. You ever bought new furnishings for your house? It's an exciting day, right, until you get that first bill. But it's exciting, right? You get new couches. Maybe you get a new television. You, you, you're, you're making up your home. You've got a house that is furnished. But you see these illustrations of these people paying big bucks to have these beautiful mansions of a house, but they, it is so expensive that they can't even afford to furnish that house But everybody thinks that they're living high on the hog. How many know anybody that I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. They can't afford anything else. They're considered house poor. But man, that looks good on the outside. And no one knows why no one ever gets invited over for a party for your big house, right? It's not furnished. Right here, they were all filled. They were all furnished with the Holy Spirit. It came in, it, it, the Holy Spirit came in and indwelled in them and em, empowered them. So you would say, well, what is the importance of Pentecost? What is so important? I've got Jesus in my heart. I've got my get out of hell free card, some people think, right? I'm good. 
I'm good. I'm going around Park Place. I'm I'm doing really good in my life. I love my life. I've seen uh, friends from high school. They they say this that that my life is finally fulfilled now, and it's bound up in a in a person that they're living with, and all these different things. And I'm thinking, oh my word, they've got to have an encounter with you, Jesus. But Jesus told them, the disciples, I want you to go and wait because I've got a little something extra for you. Are y'all with me here today? I've got something extra for you. So what's so important about Pentecost? What's the big deal? Well, number one is this. Pentecost will empower you. It will empower you. Have you ever felt weak? Have you ever felt weak and weary? you ever just wondered why... Man, Lord, some tragedy comes across your life and you just don't feel like you've got anything left to give. This is where the infilling, the furnishing of the Holy Spirit that has already equipped you will help you get through this situation. The uh, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the the earth. This word power, and you will receive power. This power, it's in the Greek, it's called dunamis. Dunamis power. It means strength. It means ability. This word power, and you will receive dunamis. It means inherent power. Power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. Power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. Power for performing miracles. You ever seen people that they're like, man, there's just tons of miracles flowing through them. Well, can I tell you, it's not them. It's the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through them. That's where people get caught up in chasing other people and chasing all these other things. Friends, we got to be very, very careful of that. Very, very careful. Because it's God who is the miracle worker, not me, not you. Now, there's people that can certainly exercise and walk in those giftings. And absolutely, there are times that that the Holy Spirit comes upon me and I will begin to move in the prophetic. But I know that I am not a prophet. God uses me in prophetic utterances, but I myself am not a prophet. I know some prophets. I do. God uses them and they walk in the mantle and the authority of a prophet. But even those who are genuine will say, listen, I could be wrong here. It's not a thus saith the Lord type situation. Y'all with me here today? Come on, let's just, let's just walk in. in smart. Power for, for, for performing miracle, miracles, this dunamis power, but it's also, and this is what's awesome, moral. Jared, can you go get me a water bottle, please? Moral power and excellence of soul. We think it's just, what is the baptism? Baptism in the Holy Spirit is just going to make me all that in a bag of chips, right? You know, look at me. You know, all of a sudden I'm like super, superman because I've, I've got the power of the Holy Spirit living in it. No, it also gives you power to live a moral life. Can I say, I see people fall all the time, fall on their faces repeatedly over and over and over and over again. And I will tell you, what, what is that? Well, number one, that's the power of the enemy that's at work within them that's holding them in that that, that rut, right? But it's also the fact that they're not operating in the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit that's ready and available to them. Hello? Are we here today? Look at this. Empowerment. In Acts chapter 2, we see what happened after this encounter with the Holy Spirit, remember the tongues of fire that were on their head? 
The Bible says this in verse 12, amazed and perplexed, people who are looking in on what's going on, they said, well, what in the world does this mean? And some, however, started making fun of them. See, we'll always make fun of what we don't understand. I have had encounters, mighty, mighty encounters with the Holy Spirit, things that I cannot even explain that have happened to me, but other people who have never encountered that, and standing out on the other side, will make fun and mock that. And I will tell you that, that happened to me one time in a revival service. There was a lady that would just begin to move and to shake under the power of the Holy Spirit, and I began to make fun of her right in the middle of a revival service. Thousands, and I'm not kidding, thousands of people were all over this room. And instead of worshiping God, I was making fun of people. I was an ordained minister. I was making fun of people because I didn't get it. You will always make fun and mock what you have not personally experienced. And I will tell you this, the Holy Spirit took me back to when I was 13 years old in my home church of a little gal in my home church begin to shake under the power of the Holy Spirit. And the same thing was happening in this vision of, of the Lord recalled that from my past when I was 13 years old, making fun of that lady in my home church because of what was going on, calling names and all of a sudden, and God brought me back into real time. And he shouted in my spirit, do not mock what I am doing. I mean to tell you if I've ever had God shout at me, it was right then, and immediately I began to tremble. I became a mocker. I went from being a mocker to being a trembler in the Holy Spirit because I heeded what he had to say. I was literally grabbing my hands because I was like, oh, dear Lord, I'm one of them, right? I'm, I, I'm, I'm shaking. I'm like, oh, Lord, what's, what's going on? Can I tell you something? I will never mock what God is doing. Never mock what you do not understand. Well, show me in the Word. Friends, you just wanted to argue for the sake of arguing. So those same people will argue with a fence post if you let them, right? Don't get in an argument with people who really don't truly want to know the truth. Don't waste your breath. Move on. There's other people that need what you got. Move on. Don't waste your time. What's important about this scripture is that it says this, Then Peter stood up from the eleven and raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd. What we've got to understand about this is just... A little bit earlier, a few months earlier, Peter couldn't even witness to a servant girl and give his declaration that he was a follower of a Christ. Now that he has been restored, now that he has been filled and overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit, now he's speaking to thousands you see, the power of God, the importance of Pentecost, Pentecost will empower you to do what you normally couldn't do. Number, number two is this. What's the importance of Pentecost? Pentecost is going to transform you. You won't be the same after you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You won't be the same. Acts chapter 9, we see Saul was still bringing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And, it, and he even got letters and notes from, from the churches, if you will, to go out and to arrest these people who were in church. And he was going out, and God knocked him off his high horse, right? He had an encounter with God. He heard, and all of a sudden, he was transformed. You switch down to Acts chapter 19. We're going to get to this. Thank you, thank you for being patient with me. Acts chapter 19, we see this. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons had touched him, were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured from the evil spirits, and they left them. You see, he went from one place, and now because he was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, now God has him in another place. That's why Pentecost is important, even yet to this day. Because God wants to empower you, but he also wants to change you. He wants to transform you. This little book right here, and we've got a few left in the back, and we can... No pun intended, we can get more. This book is called Want More. It's a book that uh, uh, from one of my evangelist friends, Tim Enlow. I've known him for decades. And this little book will help you uh, understand how do I receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. 
And some people have prayed for the baptism in the Holy Spirit for, for years and they, they can't wrap their brain around it and that's exactly the problem. You're ra- trying to uh, create something that God creates in your mind until you, you can wrap your mind around it and understand it. And many people don't get filled with the baptism in the Holy Spirit because they want to understand why first. They want to understand how it works. And God just saying, if you'll just yield yourself to me, I'll do the work. You don't need to understand it. Remember what the Word of God says? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We've got to realize that this is a free gift, this baptism in the Holy Spirit. And here's what people do. We, we think that we've got to convince God to give it to us. It's something that is free. You see... In essence, God has already decided to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The very moment you get saved, there's more. He's already written that down. It's ready and available to you right here and right now if you will receive it. And so that's why I want to march through just a few of these real quick here this morning. Is everybody falling asleep? I feel like there's nap time in the house. Right? All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Remember this. He said this, once he was eating with them, and he said, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized in water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. How do I receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Number one, you've got to pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus. You've got to pursue him you got to go after Him. When the Lord speaks to your heart and tells you, I need you to draw near to me, you need to drop everything and you need to draw near to the Lord. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you and He says, I want you to get rid of some social media for a season because I, I need to speak to you, everything's clouded. Everything's clouded right now. You need, to, you need to pursue Jesus. You need to press through and draw in to Him. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. They were meeting together not just to hang out and and play a video game, right? They were hanging out. They they weren't just coming to socialize and just uh, to break bread with one another. They were walking in obedience and pursuing Jesus. They were doing what the Lord told them to do as they watched him ascend into heaven. I'm going to be back, but you need to go away. Yay, don't forget to go and wait, right? He's, He's waving to them. You need to go and wait. You see, the rules truly have not changed. The rules have not changed. If you are hungry for more of the Holy Spirit, you will pursue Him. You're going to pursue Him. But in this Americanized church that we're living in today, we've got this concept that all of a sudden we say a little incantation, we say a little prayer that says, Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. Welcome to the kingdom. You're in. Now just sit. You're in so you don't have to worry about anything else because the grace of God, the blood of Jesus has covered you and it's okay. Just go on. You see, there's an effort that we have that's demanded on our part. If you want more of the Holy Spirit, you'll pursue after the Lord. But what happens is we get our eyes on other people. We get our eyes on other ministries. We get our eyes on other churches. We get our eyes on other things. And we see what's going on over here. When God's saying, get your eyes off of that, here's what I've got for you over here. And we get our eyes on that, oh, oh man, if I could only have a ministry, if I could only have a platform like that, if I could only have a building like that, if I could only have people that would do this like that, can I tell you what you're doing is you're getting your eyes upon man instead of the Lord. Somebody heard that today. you got to pursue Jesus. Number two, the second thing that we've got to do to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, how do I receive it? Number one, you pursue Jesus. But number two, once you pursue Jesus, the Holy Spirit is then going to come upon you. How many have ever, you've you've felt the Holy Spirit, you've you've felt him. can, Can I just ask this? Is there anyone here that you haven't? I mean, let's just be really honest. I got, I got one back there. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. You, you, 
Or maybe, maybe you have and you didn't know that you have. Sometimes we think emotions come over us, and I just, I just want to know, is it really God? Is it really, it, 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 or maybe, maybe it's just me. Listen, this is not some sort of a jokester game for God. He wants to empower. How do you think the church is in existence today? Because 2,000 years ago, in the midst of horrific trials and tribulation, they all waited on Jesus. Jesus died on the cross, ascended into heaven. They waited, and all of a sudden, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that spread like wildfire. And we are here today as a result of the day of Pentecost all those years later. Preach it faster. That's good. That's good. Yeah, it's good. You see, it's not a game. God wants to fill you. He wants to come upon you. When you pursue Jesus, He will descend upon you. He will come upon you. The scriptures repeatedly demonstrates that God responds to those who pursue him. Look in James chapter 4 verse 8. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Wash your, hand, uh, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Wash your hands. Cleanse yourself with the blood of Jesus. Draw near to him and when you do that, he will come upon you. You see, this principle applies to every transaction that we make with God. Every transaction. He gives us freedom to choose our destiny. And when he, we choose him, he will always respond to us. Why? Because he loves us. He cares for us. We go back. Acts chapter 2. Suddenly, there was a sound. Remember, they were all in one accord and all in one. And suddenly, when they responded to the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Well, how do I know? How will I know if this is God? How will I know if this is me? In your notes, you'll, you will read this. If you're pursuing Jesus by asking him to reveal himself as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and you begin to sense his indef indefinable presence descend on, on you, be confident that he is answering your prayer. Be confident. But what if it's the devil? <laughs> Listen. I have weird thinking sometimes. I have weird thinking when it, and, and I call it weird because maybe other people don't believe this. But when the very moment that I call upon the name of the Lord, I am in the secret place. The very moment I mention the name of Jesus, it's like all of a sudden, nothing else exists except, and I have an audience of one with my father. The enemy can't hear. The enemy doesn't know. The Bible tells us that you need to go into your secret place. Well, is the secret place a closet in your house that is hidden, that, you know, it's, it's your breakaway room? Is that, is that what it is? Let me tell you, the secret place is the very moment you call upon the name of the Lord, whether it's in your car, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's in the restroom, whether it's in the living room, dining room, whether it's at church, the Holy Spirit is there. That is your secret place. So when you call upon the name of the Lord, I'm a believer that the enemy can't, he, he doesn't know what you're praying and crying out to God about. This is a private conversation. You're not invited. So when we're asking the Lord to come upon us, the Holy Spirit, and we're pursuing Jesus, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't want you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because he knows what's coming when you do get filled with the Holy Ghost. He knows what's coming. He knows that you're going to now become on his most wanted list because you're empowered. And there's nothing that he can do to stop it because you're covered by the blood of Jesus and you're empowered, filled with that dunamis power that comes on, uh, on you. You are furnished with the Holy Ghost. Hmm. So how do I receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Remember, we pursue Jesus. 
What else do we do? We allow the Holy Spirit to come upon us. And what else? And this is very, very important. You cooperate with the Holy Spirit was speaking out. And that right there is probably the number one reason why people stop. Because they don't know what to do when the presence of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Roy, you know what I'm talking about. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit years ago in a little Pentecostal church right down the road from you, right? We, we go hunting together, so we have conversations on the way out to the deer stand, right? Uh, Dodd's, Dodd's church, wasn't it? Baptized in the Holy Spirit, right in that little church. And the Holy Spirit has been with you every, every step of the way all your life, hasn't he? He's never left him. The empowerment that comes upon him. But Roy had to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And how do you cooperate with the Holy Spirit? You cooperate with the Holy Spirit by speaking out. What do you do when you sense the Holy Spirit come upon you? You do what the, whole, the, the hungry believers in Acts did. You begin to open your mouth and speak. You see, many of us, what happens is when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we, we think that God is going to come in and all of a sudden... He is... The puppet master. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> and now we are the puppet. We think that way. Well, because now all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes upon me and now God is going to force His will on me and now all of a sudden it's... Well, the opposite of that is possession by the devil. I mean, let's just look at the opposite part. of it. We have this concept and idea that God is now going to possess, possess us and we have no free moral will and we're going to talk and we're going to, I'm going to obey God. And can I tell you something? That's never what God intended and that will never be that, ever. We've got to cooperate. We have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. I was so worried growing up that it was going to be me. I was so worried that it was going to be me, that it really wasn't going to be God, and I didn't want to make a mistake, and I didn't want to make a mockery out of God. I was, can I tell you, it is you. It is you. God's not coming in and forcing you to speak anything. The Holy Spirit is coming upon you, and can I tell you, I don't mean to belittle it, but it's like the Pringles commercial. Once you pop, you can't stop. I'm telling you right now, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, I'm telling you, when you begin to open up your mouth and you begin to yield that tongue to the Holy Spirit, it's like you can't stop. How many know what I'm talking about? I tell you, even yet to this day, when the Holy Spirit comes upon me in some of my weakest times, because remember, it's not just about empowering to be a witness. It's about empowerment to, for moral living and to, to upright living. Can I tell you, there's been times, and even as of late, when I have just declared, because I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say. God, I've got no answers for this, and so I will just close off my English, and I will let the Holy Spirit flow through me, because I will tell you, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you're praying the direct will of the Father. You can look it up for yourself in Romans chapter 8. You're praying the direct will of the Father. But there will be people who will argue and get so mad. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I read that on your post. <laughs> people get so mad. And can I tell you, that's sloppy theology to say that God doesn't do it. But it's also sloppy theology to say that the Holy Spirit's not dwelling within us unless you speak in tongues. That's sloppy theology too. The very moment... We ask Christ to come in our hearts. He dwells. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because there is no more temple. Remember, he tore it from the top to the bottom. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. But now that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, now it's time to turn on the power. Now it's time to open up the valve for the power of the Holy Spirit to be baptized in the authority of the Holy Spirit and watch God do awesome things. You'll read it. 
cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. Acts chapter 19, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. We've got to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Guys, come on up. I'm going to leave you with this. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Is it hot in here? Good gravy. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it says this. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men, they will dream dreams. Where's that coming from? That's call coming from the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, as the Spirit came upon seeking believers, they began to speak in other languages. They began to speak in other languages. The Holy Spirit did not force them. I want you to hear me right now. The Holy Spirit did not force them to speak, but He enabled them to. They chose to cooperate and to speak His words. And here's the key. Divine cooperation. Divine cooperation. And I tell you, there's folks in this room that you've heard about this baptism in the Holy Spirit, but remember going back to what what people don't understand they will make fun of? And you've been tainted in your understanding about the baptism in the Holy Spirit because someone who has not received it is trying to convince you that it's not real. Someone who does not have an understanding and has not ba- has not encountered, has not turned the valve on. Can we under- Can we do that? Has not turned the valve on. They don't understand that, and so they preach against it because they've not received it. The same way, there's not hot water in this house. There's a hot water heater, but there is no hot water in this house. Well, the reason why the hot water is not evident because it's not been activated. It's not been turned on. It's there. It's available. It's ready. But no one knows how to turn it on until someone does. And then once, let me tell you something, once you have hot water in your house, you start singing, it's a whole new world, a fantastic, all right? It's crazy. It's a whole new world. You got hot water in your house. How many thank God for hot water? Thank you, Jesus. But there's something that we got to do before we get to this. You can't be baptized with the dunamis power, the furnishing power of the Holy Spirit before you're a believer. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then there is no way that you can be furnished with the power, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. Can't happen. Can't happen. And if someone says, yes, I can, well, that power may be coming from somewhere, but it's not from the Holy Spirit. Hello? Have you ever encountered that? I have. Around my front doorstep. Burst her way into my house. Demi- Beth, were you there that day? Oh, yeah. Demonic activity. Kicked her way in the house. Ha- oh, it was, it was fun in the sun. Growling at me. Crossing. I mean, it was wicked crazy. 
I had peace in my heart. Why? Because the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was there. This is God's territory right here. Right? The first thing you have to do is you got to give your life to Christ. You got to get your life right. And then the power is available to you. So let's take step one. Because I will tell you this, in just a few moments, there's going to be people in this room that you're going to be refilled because you, you've been filled before, but you need to fill the tank. The tank is empty. And you need to allow the Holy Spirit to come and to fill you, not just, you know, we get comfortable. Okay, Lord, that's enough. That's, that's all I need. No, He wants to overflow. It's an overflowing. But then there's some of you here that you've never been filled before, and I believe with all my heart, if you'll cooperate with the Holy Spirit, you'll walk out of this place completely changed and completely different. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you this. If you're here today and you're not right with God, but you'd like to be, and you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, Would you slip your hand up and say, that's me. I want to I make a life change right now. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe you've never done that before, but maybe you have, but you've not lived and living your life for him. Right now is a fresh start. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up in the air and say, preacher, that's me. Anybody in this room? Anybody in this room? God bless you, son. I just want a fresh start. Anybody else? This is a fresh start. This is mulligan time right now. This is do-over. 